And Father, we ask for your forgiveness, for your mercies and your grace this morning. We repent for every word, thought, and deed that has offended you. Dead works, works of the flesh, unfulfilled vows in agreement with the voice of the stranger. Sever us from these entanglements, Master. Let the anointing and the power of your presence and the glory of your love break every yoke of bondage. As your word goes forth to each and every one in this place, that by the stripes of Jesus they be made whole. Taking dominion and authority and binding the principalities, territorial spirits, every strong man and every demonic force in this area. Casting them down to the pit. Decreeing over this land and over this area of Winter Garden. Salvation. Deliverance. Healing. Fire of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm asking that you visit every household here in Winter Garden in Okoe. In the mighty name of Jesus. Visit them in a mighty way, Lord. We break every yoke of religiosity, fear, anxiety, and stress. Sickness and disease and infirmity be gone in the mighty name of Jesus. We commit to you all things, Master. We welcome the Holy Spirit. Come teach us, guide us, protect us, establish us and perfect us, bringing us to the throne room of our Father, that we may surrender all things to you. Open our ears, eyes, and heart, Master, to receive what you have for us. Increase our faith. Encourage us today, Lord. Bring revelation and expose the enemy that his head may be chopped off today. Hallelujah. Bring revival to the body of Christ as we speak peace, blessing, salvation, stewardship, and protection to Jerusalem and Israel and your Jewish people, Lord. Those who are friends of Israel are friends of yours. And those who are enemies of Israel are enemy of yours. So, Lord, keep this nation to be steadfast as a friend to Israel. And let the body raise up her voice toward you, Lord, and protection of Jerusalem and Israel and your Jewish people. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And we welcome you. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. amen. Now go give somebody a Holy Ghost hug and tell them that this is your day. To die. This is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Praise God. Would you, let's start off with the book of Revelation in chapter 22. Revelation 22. And verse 12. Is everybody there? Let's read it together. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments. Say that again. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. Oh, so you've got to earn something to the tree of life, don't you? You've got to be obedient. And may enter through the gates into the city. Is everybody seeing this? Are you reading it? But outside are dogs. Now he doesn't mean animals. Hello. These are demonized individuals. Outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexual immoral and murderers and idolaters. And whoever loves and practices a lie. In other words, unbelievers. I, Jesus, have set my, sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come, because it's time. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. And whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. So we see here, this is the end result, isn't it? This is the end result. Jesus is coming soon. Everybody understands that. I believe that we are the generation of his return. And God is preparing his church and his bride. But there are things that God exposes. that are known as the enemies of God. The Holy Spirit quickened me this morning to share a few things about the enemies of God because we must understand what are the enemies of God. Because by associating with the enemies of God, it makes you an enemy of God. It doesn't mean he's your enemy. It means you're his. 
Are you listening? In other words, can you trust somebody that doesn't trust you? No. You never know what they're going to do. So by becoming an enemy of God, it means you've cooperated with God's enemies. And it doesn't mean that God is your enemy. He's nobody's enemy. God is a God of love and truth. But he's also a God of righteousness and judgment. But one of the things that we want to be exposed is what are God's enemies? Let's go to uh, James chapter 4. How many of y'all know we're in the last days? Hey, we're in the last minutes. You know what's going on with Jerusalem and Israel. Believe me, if you see a seven-year treaty signed, get ready. That's fulfillment of prophecy. Well, I don't know these things. Well, then get somewhere and learn them. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This isn't about religion. We're to be seeking the truth. Everybody is to be seeking the truth now. God is drawing all mankind unto him. And those who refuse will be left. Hello? You don't want to be one of those outside the gate, right? <laughs> and James chapter 4, is everybody there? Starting at verse 1, would you read it with me? It says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? That's pleasures, things that we desire according to the world. It says, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain you fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures or on your desires. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world, makes himself an enemy of God. Does everybody see this? Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Now it says that the scripture says, you know, there are so many people who claim to be believers that don't even read their Bible. Well, then you're not a believer. Hello? Why? Because it's the word of truth. The Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. How can you be a believer and not read the word of God? The eternal word that was written for me and you. Something ain't right. Well, it's just what I believe. Well, your belief is going to lead you to hell. Hello? Come on, it's time to tighten up, straighten up, and get right. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more what? Grace. Grace. Now, let me explain something about grace. Grace is the plan of God to escape the effects of the world and the wrath of God. It doesn't give us a right to go out and sin and expect to make it home. Who you serve when you die is where you go. But I accepted Jesus Christ a long time ago. Good. Are you following him? Well, I believe. No, the word believe means to follow. Let me tell you something. There's going to be a lot of people surprised when they stand before God. What does he desire? A relationship. He says, if you love me, you'll obey me. If you know me, you'll follow me. Now, the word grace here says he gives more grace. In other words, he, exp he expresses, he explains, he, he opens more ways to me and you to fight your enemy so you can escape the wrath of God in this world. Grace is the plan of escape. Do you understand that? It doesn't give you a right to go out and serve the devil. It is the plan of escape. That's why Jesus came with the fullness of love and grace. What did he do? He left us the plan to get out of here. It says, because God resists the what? Proud. Whew. See, the proud says, I can do it my way. I, I accepted Jesus a long time ago, but I'm just going to, you know, do it my way. Well, I believe that God is not a God of judgment. I believe that God just loves us all. And no matter what happens at the end, if I just believe that there's a God, I'm going to heaven. Wrong. You're deceived. Come on. It's time. Time is running out. 
And God is calling all his children. If you're here today, it's because God has brought you here, no matter what reason, to hear this message. Because he loves you and wants you to understand and discern, to begin to overcome your enemies and walk right with him, to get before him, so he can say, enter in my good and faithful servant. Is everybody okay? Look at verse 7. Therefore what? Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So understand this. Enemies of God. Well, what's an enemy of God? Somebody who's a friend of the world. A friend of the world is an enemy of God. You're his enemy when you're a friend of the world. Why? Because he can't trust you. Pride causes resistance to his will. And grace is his will, the way of escape. From the world. Does everybody understand this? Amen? Anybody say amen? amen? Come on, man. You're either agreeing or you're not. Well, I don't agree with it. Well, then you got to argue with God because it's written in the word. If you'll read the word, you might find out what the truth is. Hello? Don't be offended. Repent. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. In verse 15, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. The devil's going to be exposed. Remember, Satan's greatest weapon is deception. His greatest weapon is deception. He tries to deceive you thinking that there is another type of God than what the true God is. And his power is fear. In verse 15, would you read it with me? It says what? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That is powerful. That's what the word says, doesn't it? In other words, if you love the world, then you don't the love of the Father is not in you. In other words, if everything associated in your life is associated with this world, in other words, you live for this world, then you're not living for God. For all that is in the world is the what? Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of what? The world. And the world is passing away. And the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So remember, he says, he who does my will. What's his will? The grace. So if you're doing the will of God, if you're in the grace of God, because the grace is the plan of God, it is the will of God, for you to escape the world and the wrath of God to come. Then it says, and you will abide forever. It says, the love of the Father is not in the wages or the ways of the world. The love of God has been not of the world since man fell. That's why Jesus had to come with the true love of God. That way everybody who comes to him can receive the true love of God. So there's a difference between loving the world and loving God. Because if you love God, you come out of the world. And and I want you to explain something about lust. Lust is a desire to want. It's associated with covetousness. You know, some people think, oh, there's lust here, there's lust here. People lust over opposite sexes. It's a desire to want. It's also a representation of covetousness. Covetousness is lust. But the Bible says that the lust of the world is going to perish. So if you love the world, the world is going to perish. And if you're in the world and lover of the world, you will perish with it. Why? Because you're doing the will of the world, not the will of God. There is a difference. Now, again, I want to encourage each and every one of you. This is reality. This is truth. This is not a fable. This is not a game. This is reality. What you don't see is what you're truly fighting. There is another realm that's affecting each and every one of us here. And what is unseen must start to become seen to you now. Because time is running out. You look at Jerusalem and Israel. That is the time clock of God. What is happening there is happening in the spirit realm. There's not enough times to play games. There's not enough times to wonder, oh, well, I'll get right with God when. No, you need to get right with him today. Now. Because if you die not right with God, you go to hell. And it's a terrible place to be. There isn't one unbeliever in hell. Everyone that's there now is a believer. But it's too late. You mean if I'm a good person? No. 
that has got nothing to do with entering heaven. There is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there is the tree of life. Whatever one you eat from is the one you become. That's why many people think, well, I'm a good person. I feed the poor. I do this. But, you know, I fornicate on weekends. I do this. I, the Bible talks about no drunkards and so forth will enter. Anyone who practices unrighteousness will not enter the kingdom of God. So just because you think you're a good person will not allow you into heaven. Only the righteousness of Christ allows you to into heaven. That's it. And it's time that not only we know and that we maintain this, but others know. Time is running out. Praise God. Go to Isaiah 59. Sure is quiet here this morning. You all right? That's a serious message. You bet. It's time to get serious. No compromise. God is raising up warriors. Not wimps. <laughs> no wimps. Listen, if you're not in the, if you're not in the battle, you're going to become a casualty. <laughs> there's a war going on and it's after your soul and others. You'll either learn or burn. <laughs> what do you mean? You'll either learn the truth and know how to battle or you're going to get burned. In other words, the devil's going to burn you again and then he's going to use you to burn somebody else or you can eternally burn. Isaiah 59 verse 1, would you read it with me? Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Hallelujah. Nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. So that he will not, what? Here, some of us are going, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. But he's saying, come out of this sin. Come on out of this sin, and I'll listen to you. The Bible says that the Father searches true worshipers. True worshipers. You know, there's a amount of, you know how many people are believers and don't even give their tithes to God? No, I'm not going to pass a bucket around. It's because they trust in their own money. Their God is their money. They don't realize that the true body of Christ takes that money to bring Bibles, to bring truth, to clothe, feed, and shelter many people. But they're more interested in their own life and they call themselves believers. Well, you're in for a big surprise. It's time to tighten up, straighten up, and surrender all. Hallelujah. So what does he say? He says, listen, go to verse uh, 3. Your hands are defiled with blood. Your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies and your tongue have muttered perversity. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. They hatch viper, viper's eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies. And from that which is crushed, a viper breaks out. Now let me explain with you what this means. He who eats of the eggs, in other words, he who agrees with the voice of a stranger, will come in agreement. It produces a corruptible seeds. And that person is on his way to perishing. Iniquity has separated us from God. That is sin that is also inherited. Now, let me explain to you about the word sin. The word sin means presence of evil. Everybody say presence of evil. Everybody thinks that sin is something that they did. No, it is the presence of evil. When you agree with the presence of evil and you act on it, that is called transgression. When you act upon it, and you commit it, that transgression brings a curse on your family line, and that is called an iniquity which goes down to your children. Come on, is everybody listening? This is called truth. So what you do is going to affect your children, you home mommy and daddies here. The Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, and because you've forgotten and rejected my law, I will forget your children. So some of us are wondering why our children are going goofy. You, you mom and dad get in line and your children will get right. And no matter what happens to your children, whatever's going on right now, mom and dad get in line, your children are going to get right at the end or beforehand. Is everybody okay? Praise God. Now, remember, sin is the presence of evil. 
coming in agreement with the voice of sin will cause you to resist God's will. By resisting the truth and making yourself an enemy to God. So the one thing we don't want to do is become an enemy to God. Now it is evil who's against God's will, right? So then sin is actually your enemy. Does everybody see this? Because if sin is the presence of evil and you agree with it, it causes you to resist the will of God and rebel towards it. And then you become an enemy of God in that arena. So your enemy is actually sin. Now, the Bible says that we don't fight flesh and blood, but powers of darkness, wickedness in heavenly places. Those are called demons, evil spirits. For some of you have never heard that. They are real. Now, as believers, I want to share with you, as believers, there are three major enemies of God. As a believer, there are three major enemies of God. The first one is called doubt. The second one is called unbelief. And the third one is called fear. If the enemy can bring doubt to you, he can cause you eventually to unbelieve, and then he can cripple you with fear. Now, to an unbeliever, what usually happens is they have fear from the beginning. They have unbelief. Then they have doubt. But if you can see, it goes from fear, unbelief to doubt. Then eventually, they begin to accept and believe. Then they begin to follow. See, but a believer is one who follows. But what's going to move you out of following is doubt. Now, you may have belief in certain areas, but doubt's another. Doubt is your enemy. Go to Matthew 14. Three major enemies to you. Doubt, unbelief, and fear. Matthew 14. And Jesus was walking on water to the boat, and the disciples were in it. Verse 27, but immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. I want you to know that that's what the Lord is saying now. Come, get out of the boat. It's time to start walking on water. It's time to start walking in the spirit. It's time to come to the end of yourself. Quit trusting in man and start trusting in him. Quit trusting in your bank account. Quit trusting in your education. Quit trusting in everything else and start trusting in him. It's time. Because there's going to be a point in time when you're going to drop everything. And you're going to realize that Jesus is going to be here any moment. You will leave your jobs. You will leave where you are. And you're going to tell everybody about Jesus because he'll be coming. And he said, listen, be of good cheer. And Peter said, man, command me to come out of the boat. And he said, come. And when Peter had come down out to the boat, he walked on the water to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you little faith. Oh, you little faith. Little faith. Why do you what? Why do you what? Doubt. Whoa. So you see the combination between little faith and doubt. Oh, you little faith. Why do you doubt? So doubt is a result of little faith. Does everybody see that? Is everybody okay? Go to Matthew 21. In verse 21. Would you read it with me? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, wow, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. These mountains are circumstances in your life. He's not talking about moving physical mountains, okay? 
He's using this as an expression because sometimes these are walls in your life. These are circumstances in your life that have become mountains to you. He says, get rid of it. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Now, the problem is, is many people, after they ask for something, right? After they ask for something, they're believing. Then the enemy comes in, the spirit of doubt will come, the voice of doubt will come to speak to you and say, did you really believe what you asked for? See, the problem is, is you've got to hold on to it by faith because it's going to be in God's time, not yours. See, too many people expect God is a, a magician, you know? Oh, whew, here it is. He's going to pull something out of a hat. That's not how God operates. And I'm not going to say he can't do something instantly because I've seen people get healed instantly. I've seen people get delivered instantly. I've seen all kinds of things happen instantly. But the majority of the time it doesn't happen that way because he wants to train someone up as they're going through that circumstance so they can turn around and rescue someone else. But the problem is, is when God doesn't do it in our time and the way we expect him to do it, doubt begins to come, begins to creep in. And the next thing you know, you can fall into unbelief and then fear. Go to Luke 24. You all all right? Are you getting this? Luke 24. Now, verse 36, now the disciples were together and it says, Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were what? They were terrified. And frightened. And suppose that they had seen a spirit. <laughs> it was Jesus. <laughs> and he said to them, you idiots. No. Uh. <laughs> he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I, myself, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. <laughs> and when he had said these things, he showed them the hands and feet. <laughs> and then Jesus blew their mind, because while they were still there, uh, they believed with joy and marveled. And then Jesus says to them, you got any food? <laughs> hey, you got something to eat? <laughs> I mean, these guys are all freaked out thinking they see a spirit, right? He says, man, what's all the doubt in your mind? What's the problem? It's me. Look at my hands and my feet. It's me. Hallelujah. You're daddy. Now, what's for dinner? <laughs> now, listen. The voice of doubt <laughs> brings compromise. It brings reasoning. It justifies what worldly understanding. This is doubt. And it questions the ability of God. I'm going to say this one more time. The voice of doubt brings compromise and reasoning. It justifies what worldliness and understanding. And it questions the ability of God. That is called doubt. And Romans 14. Hallelujah. Y'all okay? Ah, that spirit of doubt's going to get exposed and we're going to cut off his head today. Amen. Doubt, unbelief, and fear are your three major enemies. So you need to learn or you're going to what? Burn. burn. You're going to get burned again. Romans 14, verse 20-something, 20 23, I believe. In verse 23, let's read it. But he who what? Doubts is what? Condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is... Wow. See, faith is in the promises of God. It is totally trusting in God. If you're not walking in faith... You're walking in the presence of evil. That's why the Bible says we do not walk by sight, but we walk by faith. So you're either you're walking in faith with the promises in the presence of God, or you're walking in the presence of evil. Do you understand? You're agreeing with the spirit of doubt. Reasoning 
is the guillotine of faith. It cuts it off immediately. So does doubt. Anything that's not of faith is sin. It is the presence of evil disqualifying faith. Go to uh, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Oh, this is good. Start at verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Welcome to the various trials. <laughs> you are going to fall into trials. Living in this world, you can't help it. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. See, so faith will produce patience. In other words, that gives endurance. That is endurance. So that you can fight through. So that you can resist the presence of evil and walk in faith. Why? Because then faith is going to allow you not to lack anything. If you're lacking things, it's because you're not walking in faith. You're walking in sin. which is the, You're either agreeing with one or the other. In verse 6, or verse 5, I'm sorry. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in what? Faith with what? No doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from God. He is double-minded, unstable in all of his ways. So I want you to understand the, the seriousness of coming in agreement with the voice of doubt. It will cause you to become double-minded. It will cause you to become unstable. And you will become an enemy of God. Does everybody understand? Because God can't trust you. First Timothy chapter 2. Did you get around a lot of people that do a lot of but, 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 but? It's called a but ministry. It means because they got a lot of doubt. They're, they're always justifying the reason. But this, but that, but this, but that. No buts. The Bible says make your yes is yes and your nose knows anything from that is the devil. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. Does everybody see that? Would you read it with me? I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up what? Holy hands without wrath and doubting. So it's okay to lift up your hands, isn't it? Hallelujah. Did you ever see a little child lift up their hands? They want to be picked up, don't they? When you lift your hands, we want to get picked up. Man, I want to get picked up. I want to pick right out of here. That's what I'd like to do. So you lift your hands up to heaven. Pick me up, Dad. Get me out of this place. So we're to be lifting up hands without wrath or without doubting. Does everybody understand that? Go to John 20. The Gospel of John, chapter 20. <laughs> now we have a lot of teachings that um, are in depth with... Um, it's these spirits, you're more than welcome to uh, look them up. They're on the uh, table there. Or you can look them up on the website. John chapter 20. There's a powerful one called Conquering Fear. John chapter 20 and verse 26. 20 and 26. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst of said to them, Peace to you. And he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be what? Unbelieving, but believing. Now, I want you to understand again, doubt will lead to unbelief. Unbelief will lead to fear. This is for a believer. If you're supposed to be a walking believer, the next thing will happen is you'll begin to doubt. The voice of doubt will bring reasoning, justification. And the next thing you know, you'll be unbelieving. Unbelieving means you're no longer following. You're justifying. You're following what you believe now instead of what God has said. You've dropped everything that you've learned to follow the dictates of your evil heart and fulfillment of the lust desires, whether it be for money, 
whether it be for sex, whether it be for drugs, whether it be for anything else. So it all starts with a voice of doubt, reasoning, and justification. And the next thing you know, you're walking in an unbelieving mode. Go to um, Mark 16. Mark 16. Verse 14. And later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the tables, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Now I want you to understand, and when you enter the arena of unbelief, you are, your heart is hardened. And you will, it will produce rebellion. One of the things that the enemy loves to do is to get you to become in rebellion, and that's a form of witchcraft. Remember, you're not fighting flesh and blood. You are fighting powers of darkness. It all starts with doubt, leads to unbelief. Now, you're no longer following. And what you're following just the dictates of your hardened heart. You have rejected the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that you can reject Him in every area, but there might be a part of something in your life that you are unbelieving for. Some people can believe for little things, but they won't believe for the big things. Some people believe that others can get healed, but they can't. It all started with doubt. You know, the Bible says that God causes. Now, I want you to hear cause. Everybody say cause. Cause. Causes the righteous to obtain wealth. Hallelujah. He's going to cause you to get wealth. But you got to be right. No, the only reason why things aren't coming and manifesting is because there's either doubt, unbelief, or fear involved. Has everybody got it? This is your enemy now. If you're a believer, you've got to constantly fight down doubt, reasoning, justification. You've got to fight these things down. You know, one of the areas is you've been offended sometime. Well, I've been offended. Let me tell you, the devil loves offense because it can harden your heart. You know, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to said that they were hurt by a church. Many. So what? You're not in a relationship with the church. You're in a relationship with God. Don't use that as a reason not to get back in fellowship. Get back in fellowship. It's important. Well, the church did this to me. Then find another one. Find another one. Quit your grumbling and complaining. Get off your blessed assurance and get in fellowship. Or you'll die. Hello? Unbelief. It'll kill you. Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Oh, good. 57. God's good. <laughs> Are you all okay? How many of y'all want to hear the truth? Amen we got to have the truth. See, the Bible says that knowing the truth and not practicing it will kill you. The Bible says letter kills, but the Spirit brings life. But knowing the truth and practicing it will set you free. That's why freedom is learned and trust is earned. In Matthew um, 13 and verse 57... Would they read this with me? So they were what? Offended at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now, he did not do many mighty works there because of their what? Unbelief. So you're expecting God to do a mighty work? Well, you better start getting some belief. Start removing doubt. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we have one more scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Is so everybody there in verse 6? 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6. So the spirit of doubt, spirit of unbelief. We have teachings all on this over there in depth. This is just a little intro. Spirit's quicken me to start exposing the enemies of God. Verse 6, would you read it with me? Therefore, I remind you to what? Stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. 
For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Do you understand the spirit of fear means a demon? But what? Power and of love and of a sound mind. So that spirit of fear will cripple you. It will cripple you. You know how many people are stranded and caught up in, in, in homes that can't even leave their houses because of fear? And the, of course, the, the world, the secular world, now remember the word secular means without God. The secular world will medicate them. And what happens is they medicate the individual who's got a phobia. That's a demon. We see people get healed of it all the time. Where they can't even leave their house, their rooms. They put people in shock therapy. They medicate them. And what all it does is causes the physical body not to respond to the demon. But the demon is still there getting fed. Those people need to go through deliverance. You see, the Bible says spirit of fear. It is fear. He is your enemy. He is an evil spirit. Go to Romans 8. And we'll close there. Let's start at 13. So anybody who's a friend of the world is a what? An enemy to God. Whew. That's called flesh. Verse 13, if you live according to the world, you will what? Die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. How many of y'all want to be sons of God? For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to what? Fear. But you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, which means Daddy. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the suffering of this present world or this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. That's you. Hello. And those who are led by the Spirit are what? Sons of God. Remember your three major enemies are doubt, unbelief, in fear. And like I said, we have more in-depth teachings available. Come out of the arena of becoming an enemy of God. And expose your enemies that are causing you to be an enemy of God. Anywhere God can't trust you, you're his enemy. If he can't trust you in your finances, you're his enemy. If he can't trust you in your relationship with your spouses or your children, you're his enemy. Does everybody understand that? If he can't trust you in an area of your life, you're his enemy. And then that means that there is a voice of doubt, unbelief, or fear. Remember, lust means love. It's a desire. It's the wrong kind of love. It's worldly love. The world lusts after things. It desires it. It covetouses it. It wants it. It brings a fulfillment to them that is temporary. That's why people sometimes who are very wealthy are always looking for more. Because they're trying to buy happiness. There's people who go to college. They feel get fulfilled by all the education they get. But there's only one fulfillment. And that's in his presence. That's it. Because we are all spirits with a flesh suit. One day, everyone here will die and stand before God. There is no escaping it. And you'll either be his servant, his son, his child, or his enemy. It's up to you. Learn or burn. Amen? Let's lift our hands to heaven. Father, we thank you for your word today. We are honored and blessed. We know you're coming soon, Master. We know. And I pray for each and every one that's here today, Father, that their hearts be prepared. And repent of their unrighteous deeds. 
As we prepare our hearts to receive communion today, Lord, let your word today be imparted in your spirit, sealed by the blood of the Lamb, that it will grow and bear fruit for your glory. Let it break any hardened heart. Let it separate. You said, come out of the world. Don't touch anything unclean and I will receive you. So if you're in this house today and you need reconciliation, I encourage you, repent, give your life back to the Lord, and you can see anybody in this ministry to pray with. We're all here for you. And to God be all the glory. And everybody said, Hallelujah.